Yeah, so today Council Member Boone and I are here at the great C.T. Martin Recreation Center giving away backpacks that are stuffed with school supplies for those kids in need around this community. It's back to school time. Each year we do a big uh, back to school bash here. Well, we're not going to let the coronavirus stop us because these kids still need backpacks and they need to be educated. So we're excited seeing families get what they need at this time. Usually we do this event inside. People can come and pick out their backpacks, but we're trying to maintain social distance and to be safe. You see we're all wearing masks and we're putting them in their trunk or in their back seat so that we're contactless and we want to make sure we stay safe and keep the kids and the family safe. So we're doing it uh, you know, outside. I'm Phyllis Jackson. Thanks for joining us for Stay at Home Connect. Atlanta Public Schools kick off the school year virtually after delaying the start date by a couple of weeks. There is a new web page set up with information on family resources and technology support, and the district will continue providing meals to students. Rockdale, Hall, Carroll, and Merriweather also began welcoming students back virtually. Merriweather providing an option for both in-person and online learning. Georgia Tech reports dozens of coronavirus cases. The website indicates that the students live on campus and are either returning home to isolate or moving to isolation housing, which is being provided by Georgia Tech. And those who may have come in contact with the students are being notified. A portion of those cases are connected to a fraternity house. In a statement to students, faculty, and the staff, University of Alabama President Dr. Stuart Bell says there is an unacceptable rise of COVID-19 cases on campus. He says, quote, the trend is a real threat to our ability to complete the semester on campus, end quote. The school resumed classes August 19th, and despite re-entry testing, isolation, quarantining, and sanitation protocols, the school is still seeing the challenge of rising cases. The president says that violations of health and safety protocols, both on and off campus, will lead to disciplinary action, which could include suspension. Dr. Bell says although the goal is to complete the fall semester, the margin for error is shrinking. The coronavirus pandemic leads Airbnb to implement a global ban on parties and events indefinitely. With restaurants and bars closed in many places, some guests are using Airbnbs for unplanned events. When this happens, it can put you at risk. It damages our relationship with your neighborhoods and local communities, and it's even more disheartening during a global pandemic. Occupancy will now be capped at 16 people. Company representatives say certain countries, including the United States, have added an additional restriction. No one under the age of 25 will be allowed to book a house on Airbnb. Violations will lead to legal action. Officials say the move is in the best interest of public health. Just weeks away from its regular season opener, the NFL is hit with a setback after COVID-19 testing results in 77 false positives. The results are impacting several teams, including the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Minnesota Vikings. Five nationwide labs are overseeing testing for the league, with one lab out of New Jersey reporting the false negatives. Recent tests confirmed four positive results from players at training camps. Those with questionable results are being retested. Atlanta City Council members Andre Dickens and Andrea Boone host a back-to-school bash at the C.T. Martin Recreation Center. Kids received needed backpacks and school supplies for the new year. We're not going to let the coronavirus stop us because these kids still need backpacks and they need to be educated. So we're excited seeing families get what they need at this time. That's going to do it for Stay at Home Connect. Have a safe evening.
Yeah, so today, Council Member Boone and I are here at the great C.T. Martin Recreation Center giving away backpacks that are stuffed with school supplies for those kids in need around this community. It's back to school time. Each year we do a big uh, back to school bash here. Well, we're not going to let the coronavirus stop us because these kids still need backpacks and they need to be educated. So we're excited seeing families get what they need at this time. Usually we do this event inside. People can come and pick out their backpacks, but we're trying to maintain social distance and to be safe. You see we're all wearing masks and we're putting them in their trunk or in their back seat so that we're contactless and we want to make sure we stay safe and keep the kids and the family safe. So we're doing it uh, you know, outside. Can one girl in a small town, an architect in a major city, and a suburban high school coach shaped the future of the United States? Yes, they can. Because every 10 years, the census gives us that power. You can shape your future by responding to the 2020 census. Where do we need new roads to make our lives easier? Where will new school programs help our children thrive? Where could a new health clinic benefit neighborhoods? The 2020 census will inform these decisions and shape how billions of dollars will be distributed to communities like yours each year. And in 2020, you can respond to the census online, by phone, or by mail. It's easy, safe, and important. Make sure you and everyone you know is counted. Now is the time for you to get involved. Your community needs you. Together, we can educate and excite inspire and make sure every voice is heard. Together, we can shape our future. I'm Phyllis Jackson. Thanks for joining us for Stay at Home Connect. The federal government officially declares teachers as essential workers, saying the designation simply provides guidance and is voluntary. However, it calls on educators to return to the classroom even after possible exposure to coronavirus, as long as they remain asymptomatic. The state of Virginia is using a new technology in the hopes of containing coronavirus. Virginia is proud to launch a new digital app called COVID Wise, C-O-V-I-D-W-I-S-E, that will be able to send you alerts if, you're, if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive. This app, COVID Wise, does not, I'm gonna repeat that, does not track or store your personal information. It does not track you at all. It doesn't rely on GPS or your personal information. And while we want everyone to download it, it is voluntary. Instead, it uses the Apple Google Bluetooth low energy technology, which assigns random keys to positive cases. It uses those keys to determine if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for the COVID-19 virus and send you an alert. AMC theaters open with 15 cent movie tickets and a safe and clean initiative. We thoroughly enhanced our cleaning procedures and upgraded to HEPA filter vacuums and MERV 13 air filters. New electrostatic disinfectant sprayers are used in auditoriums before each showtime. All auditorium capacities are reduced to allow for social distancing. Masks are still required in the auditorium unless you're enjoying food or drinks. Atlanta City Council member Carla Smith will join with officials from Invest Atlanta for the Summerhill Small Business Lending Webinar later this month. If you are a Summerhill business owner, you will need to register. You can go to investatlanta.com and click on the Events tab for more. Well, that's a wrap for Stay at Home Connect. 
Have a great night. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Transportation Committee here uh, for the Atlanta City Council. Uh, the time is now 9.30, and I call this meeting to order. Um, my name is Andre Dickens. I am your chairman for this committee. Um, and actually, let me do something yeah, I think wrong committee in um, inside of our uh, agenda. I, I need to uh, this technology situation here. <clears throat> Let me close this out and put in a different. They had me in the uh, full council meeting. I'm not, I'm not ready to be there yet. Okay, now I'm in the Translation Committee uh, digitally. All right, so now I call this meeting to order. This is Andre Dickens. I serve as your chair for the Transportation Committee. Um, we have a quorum on the line. Uh, I think we have Council Member uh, Marcy Collier Overstreet, uh, Amir Faroki, JP Mazike, and Matt Westmore. Uh, did I mention, did I forget anybody? Is anybody else, has anyone else joined the line? I'm on the line, yeah. Council Member Dickens. Okay, great. All right. Hey, Andre, Council Member, this is Jennifer Idol. So I don't know if you called my name or not. 
Oh, okay. All right, good. I'm getting messages uh, from <laughs> from uh, Julia, and she's letting me know as you guys are saying it. So, yes, uh, we have Council Member Ide on the phone. We have Hiroki, Overstreet, Brown, Massachusetts, and Westmoreland. We have a quorum of all members. Thank you all for being here. Um, so I call this meeting to order. Now we will have our uh, remote meeting statement from Ms. Pulandini. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This transportation committee meeting is being conducted remotely as advertised and as in accordance with OCGA 50-14-1. The meeting will be conducted in conformance with Robert's Rules of Order and the Rules of Council as authorized by the City Code. The public may access the meeting by dialing 877-579-6743, conference ID 831-599-1256, which was noted on the August 21st, 2020 public meeting notice. The public may also view the meeting on Channel 26, the Council's homepage at citycouncil.atlantaga.gov, the Council's YouTube channel, or the Council's Facebook or Twitter pages via at ATL Council. All presentations are available on the Atlanta City Council Transportation Committee presentation page. The agenda was published and made available on August 21, 2020 via atlantacityga.umc.com. In addition, the public was able to submit comments via voicemail at 404 330 6059 between the hours of 4 and 7 p.m. the day before this meeting. These comments will be played during the public comment portion of the meeting. All persons present on the remote council meeting conference bridge are requested to mute your phones and speakers. Additionally, speakers must be acknowledged by the presiding officer prior to speaking. Each council member is requested to open your Outlook email and minimize the screen. Amendment substitutes and informational documents have been distributed to committee members beforehand. Thank you all in advance for your cooperation. All right, thank you all. Uh, thank you for that, Ms. Pulandini. All right, now I will ask, uh, I will make a motion to adopt the agenda. Is there a second? Second, Westmoreland. All right, let's prepare our vote. Vote is open. Let's prepare our, uh, let's vote everyone. Um, Mr. Brown, I see you haven't voted yet. Are you voting uh, verbally? Yeah, affirmative. Uh, I, I, my computer is down, so I'm, I'm doing voice vote today. Okay. The vote is closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. The agenda has been adopted. All right, I make a motion to approve the minutes. Is there a second? Second, second. Brown. All right, that's a second by Brown. Let's prepare a vote. How do you vote, Mr. Westmoreland? Ten in favor. Thank you. All right. Vote is closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. The minutes have been approved. All right, now it's time for public comment. Do we have any? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, we have five messages and we will play them right now. Thank you. I'm Sally Fox, a long-term resident of Atlanta who founded the sort of previously as leader of feds, Atlanta's pedestrian advocacy organization. I'm calling to urge you to approve the resolution directing city agencies to prepare a holistic multi-year plan to pay for sidewalk construction and to fund the elimination of the very large backlog of broken sidewalks in Atlanta. I've been asking the city to fund six broken sidewalks for over 20 years, and I'm thrilled that you'll be moving forward on this. Please pass the resolution. I wholeheartedly support it. Thank you, and keep up your great work. Greetings to you, committee members and staff, and special greetings to you, citizens of Atlanta, monitoring your government in action. Ben Howard, senior advocate, public policy analyst. Agenda item G19, 20-R-4308, is a resolution authorizing the issuance of Task Order 13 with the SDMC Corporation for the maintenance and repair of sidewalks, curbs, driveway aprons, and associated infrastructure. This infrastructure legislation should also appear on the agenda for neighborhood planning.
spending units are. Residents within neighborhood planning units are, are interested in projects that might be of benefit to them. In 2006, senior citizens and other residents along Campbellton Road were promised continuing updates on Campbellton Road Phase 1, Campbellton Road Phase 2, and Campbellton Road Phase 3. That 2006 meeting was held at Mount Carmel Baptist Church because people impersonating neighborhood planning units on leadership at that time would not allow such matters to be placed on NPUR agendas. On three occasions, representatives of a city certified resident organization, which is also protected under the provisions of the United States Housing and Urban Development Department, known as HUD, were denied the right to be placed on the agenda of neighborhood planning unit R to discuss matters on behalf of senior citizens and stakeholders in the proximity of senior zone on Campbellton Road. If you somehow decide to have matters like 20R-43-08, vetted by the Campbellton Road community, be advised in any attempt to add any edifying information to the tightly controlled agenda of NPUR to be getting fiercely distanced from the NPUR 9. Anthony Robinson, Corliss Clare, Ricardo Jacobs, Lynette L. Scott, Alvin White, Allison Hathaway, and the NPUR 9 cohorts. Good morning. My name is Kathy Tyler, the president and CEO of PETS. I would like to applaud Councilmember Soroki for his uh, resolution 20R4264. If this is an effort to fix the line of sidewalks and his desire to make equity a priority, we urge the city when creating this model, sidewalk projects are important for all zip codes, especially in communities where the majority of pedestrian fatalities are occurring. We know that data shows that the majority of pedestrian deaths occur in communities of color. If the city of Atlanta is serious about Vision Zero, the fastest way to get there is to prioritize those communities. Thank you very much. This is Kathy Tyler, President and CEO of TEDS. Hi, my name is Carolyn Rader, R-A-D-E-R. I am the chair of PEG, Pedestrians Educating Drivers on Safety, and we um, want to support Amir Faroqi, council member of Amir Faroqi's several resolutions that call for the city of Atlanta and the Atlanta Department of Transportation to prepare a multi-year payment plan regarding um, the paying down of the city's sidewalk repair backlog and looking for ways to also fund new construction and other purposes, um, as well as uh, the other um, resolution as well to provide a plan or sidewalk implementation. So um, we wanted just to make sure that, that he knows we are very appreciative of this, these two resolutions and uh, we look forward to supporting the City of Atlanta and Department of Transportation and implementing this plan. Thank you. Bye-bye. I'm Brother Anthony I'm an original person, ancient ancestor. In this year, committed more and more smear who drove my car from the high school and frequency to nature. I believe in religion, Christianity, the Bible, and Jesus, the revelation of one human person was born from a woman name. And I ask you, members of the church, to taste me, the number is more the president of the county. 2010, I advocated for months with Mr. Martin, and other members of the council to have a paved room, sidewalk, illuminated light put on the street that needed a traffic light, and we got that. I asked why that 2017, seven years after they paid my street, I kept fighting and asking, do something for Burton Road, do something for a street that had been service in 30 years in District 11 when this over street pump. I was told by the chairman, Mr. Dickens, oh yes, we're going to get something done. I have documentation. 
on a Mr. Reed's illustration to say my whole services should be put on that room. And we hadn't had it done yet. And we talk about voting for the president, a man that had continued to support him, locking up a young man that looked like myself and you just over street. And yet, you have the day I heard four million dollars has been taken back by the federal government grant to help poor people, and you want us to believe in you all? I'm saying you, council members, are not being transparent. You don't have no character. And then you are carbonated, clear people, original, aboriginal people that have taken on a culture contrary to right, contrary to good, for the poor. And I'm speaking for the poor and all those that can speak for themselves. Women that not understand and give us back services, give us recognition. Or ever since you have service money, you have a lot of it. And not a workforce to take money and not provide the services. You have lied to yourself to let grants go back to the federal government. This ain't no Caucasian leadership in the city of Atlanta. Just the you new ones today. You new council people in the country. I have the documentation to show what the difference in this overseer are not doing. So would you stand, would you stand for the majority of citizens to live in this level to house? And that concludes our public comment. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you to all those that uh, made your comments known. Um, and we have heard them and take them under consideration. Uh, now we will go to presentation, and we have our MARTA quarterly update. We're going to have Jeff Parker, CEO of MARTA, <clears throat> come to uh, the microphone or oh, come to uh, onto the phone. Jeff, are you unmuted? Chairman Dickens, can you hear me all right? Yes, I can. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you for, for having me, and uh, also thank you to uh, your fellow council members who are in attendance today. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, several board members who I know are uh, watching online as well, Chairman uh, Preet Hardage, as well as our uh, City of Atlanta uh, board members, uh, Robert Ash, Dr. Rod Edmonds, and, and Ryan Glover. So thank you for their support to MARTA and to the city of Atlanta. Uh, the, the first slide, the, the agenda, um, we're going to share uh, several uh, uh, discussion points, uh, give you a update on some initiatives that, that we've put in place recently, uh, state of good repair update, uh, where we are advancing the more MARTA program, and then an update on our TOD program. Next slide, which is titled MARTA Rider Initiatives, um, and we'll move to, right to uh, uh, slide number four, Hope Atlanta Partnership. So, uh, you know, we've, uh, we're really, really excited about a new partnership that's been in the works for a while and is off and running. Uh, we have entered into a relationship with uh, Hope Atlanta that I know you're all very familiar with. They do a wonderful job here in the city. Um, they've become a partner for a year-long program, um, and by no means are we trying to limit this to a year. I think uh, the, the early successes leads me to believe that this will be an ongoing effort. But we're really trying to make sure that, that, that um, the unsheltered in this city, and particularly the uh, the unsheltered who are sheltering on MARTA, are treated uh, fairly. We all recognize that being unsheltered is not a crime, but we've also re received numerous complaints about customers uh, riding unsheltered. So we thought that the best thing to do is to be proactive, take this out of a policing environment and move this into working with uh, social workers from Hope Atlanta, as well as uh, protective specialists who are civilian employees of MARTA, working in teams, moving around the system, identifying hotspots and stations and other facilities, including bus shelters, to just reach out to our homeless population 
Um, this program has is, is only been uh, up and running for, for two weeks, but it's great to report that we've already found housing for two unsheltered individuals on the MARTA system. So we'll, we'll continue to keep you apprised of this program, but we at MARTA are very excited about that. Next slide, the MARTA Rider Advisory Council. Um, I think when I last presented, we had literally just selected the names, had not released them yet. Um, so I want to provide you an update on that. We've, we, we are meeting with, with the Rider Advisory Committee Council. We've, we've stood it up. Uh, we received 80 applicants, 24 members were selected. Seven of the members in those pictures are here. Uh, do represent the city of Atlanta. So we've got some great um, uh, members uh, supporting the, the council from the city of Atlanta. They will focus on a broad range of customer issues, trying to make sure that we're bringing the customer perspective more actively into everything that we do. Have an upcoming meeting where we will be focusing on finances and, and our 21 budget. It's important for this collective group of people to understand the inner workings of, of MARTA. But the important things that they've been focusing on are elevators and escalator improvements, our signage program, which we call ABIS, which uh, will provide better information to our customers around train or arrival times. Um, our station renaming process, as well as passenger amenities on our rail car. Uh, one of our members who, uh, who um, is from the city of Atlanta is, uh, is talking to us and, and advocating for doing a better job with assisting passengers uh, with disabilities on elevators and escalators. So we're excited about that. Next slide, masks on the system. Um, excited to, uh, to, to tell you about really a uh, complete change in, in, in the approach um, of our customers, and we're very excited about this. Back in June, we observed only about 35% of our, our customers wearing masks on MARTA. We knew that this would um, just, you know, have potential disastrous, uh, you know, implications for, for public health, for our employees. Um, in early July, we announced that we would be distributing uh, 2 million masks throughout our system, and we've been actively doing that. We've had um, both our station personnel, our police officers, as well as our administrative staff staffing uh, multiple shifts. And, and to date, we've, uh, we've handed out 417,000 masks. We continue to do it, and, and the good news is that um, as you can see in the AJC headline, we have about 90% of our customers wearing masks. Um, we are enforcing the mask uh, mandate through our Rider with Respect program, although um, we really have had virtually no need to enforce the program when, when confronted people are willing to, to wear masks when, when given one. So good news about that. Next uh, slide, State of Good Repair Program update. The title slide will move right into the next one, Elevator Escalator Rehabilitation. Um, have had a lot of uh, conversations since I've been presenting to, uh, to this uh, committee about where we are, but I don't think I've ever given you uh, a good overview of, of what we're trying to accomplish, um, what are the overall benefits, um, we have very old elevators and escalators, um, 30, 36 to 40 years old, some of them. Um, these, are, these are very, very heavy duty elevators and escalators. Unlike, you know, in a, in a typical office building, these elevators are, are being ridden by a, a lot more people, heavy crowds. Um, the, the service cycle is, is substantially more difficult um, than a, you know, an office building's elevator or escalator. Back in 2016, we approved a 10-year contract for over $200 million to rehabilitate, um, both, both rehabilitate 116 uh, escalators and, and 111 elevators, but also um, to, to maintain the existing elevators as well. We began construction on the rehabilitation back in June of 2017, and to date, we've got just under 40% of our elevators and 21% and of our escalators rehabilitated, and we continue this for about seven more years on this ongoing effort. It's paying dividends. It will continue to pay dividends. 
Um, next slide, please. Uh, continuation of the elevators, but, but we know that we need to uh, continually improve the communication to our customers about the availability of, of, um, of this. And these are just some of the things that we've done um, over the past several months. Uh, the first one is uh, on our service alert page, and this has been in, in, in uh, use for, for several months where we have a very specific uh, information available on the website for uh, workarounds, what elevators are out of service, either, either because of construction, uh, rehabilitation work, or because of the, the systems failed. But just uh, just recently, we're, we've installed um, these flip signs, very simple, kind of fail-safe design. Um, the, the slide on the right is what you would see if you came up to an elevator that was in service. Thank you for riding MARTA. Have a wonderful day. Um, and then when, it, when an elevator is out of service, either for maintenance or failure, um, the, the, the staff member would simply unlock it, flip it down, and now there would be uh, tailor-made directions at that elevator for what the person who is now unable to use that out-of-service elevator. Here's an example of a sign at, at North Ave Station. So we're installing these throughout the system. I think we're just about done at installing all of these signage at all of our elevators. Next slide, uh, station restroom update. Uh, as I had uh, mentioned to you before, we did uh, close the, uh, the, uh, our restrooms uh, with the exception of Five Points Lindbergh and our end of line stations really to make sure that, that we were trying to uh, promote a safe environment for our, our customers and our employees. Um, but we also felt that um, it was important to, uh, to recognize that, you know, we have more people wearing masks. We have much more awareness of washing hands and all the things that the uh, public health um, wants to do. And, and, and also we had some conversation with Chairman Dickinson and, and um, you know, brought to our attention, you know, you know challenged us on, on rethinking this policy. So we have reopened uh, the 17 stations that do have station agency agents in them back to where we were uh, pre-COVID-19. So we're, we're uh, back having our uh, station agents uh, giving access to employees who need to use the restroom. Next slide, track renovation uh, phase four. Um, we call this TR4 internally, uh, began with uh, uh, doing some significant track work on the east line in the area of Avondale and, and East Lake train station, but we have some pretty significant work that we'll be doing Beginning in February of 2021, um, feels like a long way off. It will be here before we know it. Uh, north of Lindbergh Station, uh, where I am now, we have um, some major crossovers that allow, um, one allows you to, to go either to the gold line or red line, and then some other ones can control some other interlockings. These are key crossovers that need to be repaired. And we have to uh, do a major shutdown um, of stations between Lindbergh, Lennox, uh, Lindbergh and Lennox and, and Lindbergh and Buckhead in order to, to alleviate this uh, and do the work as quickly as possible. Otherwise, we would be um, doing this work over many, many, many weekends, um, impacting more customers. And so we are working on a significant, and we'll move to the next slide, track renovation phase two continued. Um, we're working on a very significant um, workaround so that we have replacement bus service, uh, making sure that we have enough buses and employees. This will be a major effort to, uh, to move people um, in this shutdown. Uh, the, the impact of the rail service from a Tuesday evening at 10 p.m. until the following Monday, so that would go all the way through the weekend um, with Monday morning service uh, being back to normal. We will have uh, buses staged. We'll have uh, trains will be placed above the, the shutdown locations to provide service north and south of where we're doing it. And we are uh, will be undertaking a significant communications program to make sure our customers are aware of this and then a significant uh, operational change so that we can uh, absolutely minimize the impact to our customers who are traveling during that five-day period. Next slide, advancing the More Marta Capital Program. We'll uh, move right from that into the 
FY 2021 Atlanta projects. Uh, you can see a list here of, uh, of the projects that we are focusing on over the next five year period. Um, I want to thank you uh, for um, approving the uh, IGA between uh, MARTA and the city of Atlanta. Um, this IGA is, is critical to this re the relationship that we have, defines roles and responsibilities to execute these projects. And uh, really, now that we've got that behind us, the, uh, the, the hard work really begins, and we're excited about this hard work. We are very close to launching a new uh, MARTA 20, 2040 website so that anyone, um, citizens, riders, elected officials, board members, um, MARTA staff can see a, a full update on the progress of each of our projects. And I'll give a very brief update on uh, to you on where some of these projects are. Summerhill Capital at BRT, um, two public uh, meetings were held in early August. The team continues to meet with stakeholders as the design progresses, and uh, we are on track to allocate the funding by the September 30th deadline, which is a critical milestone that we have with the FTA. Hamilton Road Corridor, we continue to progress in a, a detailed analysis of alternatives, modes, transit lanes, alignment stations, and develop strategies for implementing uh, TOD within the, uh, the, the station areas. The five-point station transformation, we do have a project level agreement has been developed and it's by MARTA and is uh, being reviewed by the city uh, and, and that will uh, be executed relatively soon. The streetcar extension, uh, we are in uh, discussions in a project level agreement with Atlanta Beltline Inc. Uh, so that we can have clarity on roles and responsibilities on the development of this corridor. Um, although we have begun uh, the survey work that is required to support the, uh, the, the early stages of, of design. So we continue to work on that. Our arterial uh, uh, bus rapid transit system continues to progress on GDOT with, uh, with working with GDOT in the city of Atlanta. We're also working with East Point and, and Hapeville to coordinate and confirm uh, recommended uh, service scenarios and alignments and advanced stations and amend these designs and, and, and continue to work on our detailed cost estimates. And finally, the Bankhead Station, we continue to progress uh, a confirming and confirming the uh, recommended station design concept and advancing the uh, station design and detailed cost estimates. So those programs are all advancing well, and we'll we'll continue to provide updates and uh, and we should be able to show you the uh, the new website at our next quarterly update. So looking forward to that. Next slide: TOD development update. We'll move right to. Um, the, uh, the map of the jurisdictions, the slide with the map of the jurisdictions, which is slide 16. Uh, important to just remind us of the good work that we're doing throughout the system. Um, and a piece of that is, uh, you know, significant um, units either being built, under design, negotiated, or, or, or planned. And you can see uh, these significant numbers, I won't go over them in, in detail, but a total of 23 DO, uh, TODs. And uh, included in this, as you know, is a significant focus on, uh, on affordable housing. And, and we just continue to, uh, to push the envelope and make sure that um, we are advancing the needs for affordable housing throughout our, our TODs and around the system. Next slide, TODs in the city of Atlanta, quick update. Uh, King Memorial, um, it's, uh, if, if you go by that site now, the uh, it's, it's construction has begun um, early deliverable, uh, early 2020, 2022 uh, delivery of uh, 300, approximately 300 units of multi uh, family housing with 100, 100 affordable workforce units, as well as 10,000 square foot of commercial space that's moving along well. Um, most recently, the board of directors has authorized staff to begin negotiations with Portman Holding. They did this back in uh, at the August meeting. 
and we continue to advance the uh, opportunity zones. We have decided to break them into two phases, and you can see the phases here. Um, and we, we continue to see this as a great opportunity to advance affordable housing and, and as well as development in, in these communities. So looking forward to, to working with you all on these. And with that, uh, my last slide, thank you, and uh, open the turn it back to you and see if we have any questions about my presentation or anything else. So, Chairman, back to you. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for that presentation. Um, thank you for the summary. And, um, and I know council members are, are, are chiming in with some questions that they will have. So, council members, hit your speaker button. I am watching at that. I do have you, Mr. Brown. Thank you for your text with that. You want to speak. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to just share with you, uh, Mr. Parker, that I am thankful that you guys have demonstrated something that everybody else hasn't been, you know, that people don't often demonstrate, which was the ability to take a recommendation and pivot. Uh, a couple of times during the last two months or three months of this pandemic, um, I'm proud to say that Marta, you know, made plans, laid plans, and started moving in a direction that was great. And in some areas, there were some areas that, you know, conversations with uh, the community, and, and, and of course, I had a conversation with you, allowed you guys mm -hmm. to see some things just a little differently, not necessarily that it was wrong. Yeah. And uh, so, like, uh, I applaud you for opening back up the uh, restrooms and, um, I, we understood the logic behind why you made the decision in the first place, but also grateful that you pivoted based on the conversation with myself and some, you know, Sherry Williams, Deborah Scott, and mm -hmm. uh, George and, and our Transformation Alliance. So glad to have a listening ear that you and Frank and Melissa and Erica uh, paid attention to. Thank you for that. And also, I know the mask being not mandatory and then being mandatory, that kind of was a quick swift <laughs> swing. I mean, it might have been 48 hours uh, yeah. that you, you had to swing from one thing that the state told you and another thing that the city uh, that we enforced. And to be able to do that and not point fingers, not cause us think about it, but to just get it done on behalf of the people of, of the riders and the people that the riders would eventually touch and affect once they got to their destinations. I just applaud you guys for making that decision. Um, so, so thank you. I don't know if you want to say anything to that because I have some other stuff. Yeah, but. no, you, you know, I, you know, I appreciate you, uh, you, you know, you, you, you pointing out our pivot. Um, but I, you know, I also want to thank you and, uh, you and others. I, you know, uh, I'll be, um, you know, honest, the, the, the restroom, um, issue was, you know, we've got a lot of stuff going on and, and that was, um, that was, you know, unfortunately not, not top of mind for me. Um, we had a very, very constructive conversation with some community leaders that you pulled together and it was like the aha moment, you know, how simple it was just to, just to react to the needs of our customers. So, so it's, it's always good. And, you know, you and, and, uh, and your fellow members of, uh, of the city council have always always been people who uh, who give us uh, constructive ideas and, and we appreciate that it makes us better and ultimately we're just we're just trying to make this a better system for our customers and the constituents who uh, who live here in the city of Atlanta and throughout these jurisdictions so so thank you yeah yeah so have, how are we doing with the uh, rider? committee or board, I forget what we're calling it, the, the, the yeah. ridership yeah. board. Mm -hmm. the, 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 uh, the official name, Rider Advisory Council, um, we have had um, three meetings so far. Um, the, uh, you know, we, we have monthly scheduled meetings with them. Um, Right now, off of the bat, it's really been um, first couple of meetings. We have, uh, you know, tried to to build some camaraderie between this group of people, which, which quite frankly, is not the easiest thing to do these days. You know, we're doing these meetings virtually, obviously, and and getting 24 people um, in a room together, a virtual room, who don't know each other. 
but are, are, are you know, are, are trying to, to work together. So, so we, you know, we move forward on that. We've also put together some, some software and, and, and maybe we could, can bring you some information details about that next week that sort of will allow some, uh, some suggestions by this group, um, be made and, and collected in a way that, that, Staff can uh, can access it and distill it and, and allow for better communication of, of, of ideas. This is something that uh, uh, you know, kind of off the shelf software that, that we, we're we're beginning to use with this group. Um, like I said, we're focusing this next meeting on our budget. I think that it's you know you know one one of the things we have to recognize is that we've got a tremendous amount of needs. And we've got to balance that against, uh, you know, a, a financial reality, right? That's that's government, right? You, you, you. I'm talking to a group of people who understand that that completely. Um, so we need to uh, make sure that both the Rider Advisory Council understands our needs and can influence those needs, but also understands the the, the constraints we have of of how we're funded, and and so we'll be doing that. So I think it's, you know, I think it's it's uh, a a very very strong group we've got a lot of um as you would expect we've got a lot of people who have a lot of great ideas and and a commitment and a lot of energy so so we're we're excited about this good good um the other question i had was um what i know there was a lot of back and forth well attempts at back and forth by some people related to the downtown portion of the summer hill brt um have we got that resolved so that we don't have any delays in getting uh getting what we need uh submitted by september 30th yeah no we are we're on we're on track for the september 30th deadline um the the uh what's left to do is is um is really process stuff the the fta has has given us what they call paper approval of our grants and now that needs to be loaded into their team system and, and then they give us the official so 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 that important deadline is 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 on track you know we 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 continue to uh to work with the stakeholders um in uh in downtown we had a a, a very good meeting like a maybe two weeks ago with uh with uh central Atlanta progress talking about um you know, talking about why, you know, what, what we did and how we got to the recommendation of the route, um, over into over. high points. And, uh, you know, I've, I've reached out to the major developers in the area because they're key stakeholders. So, so we're, you know, we're committed to continue to, to, to work with them, continue to provide them good information. Um, you know, I know, uh, you know, one of the developers who's, who's, um, you know, in, in, in the middle of it all is, is, uh, you know, working on how, you know, looking at how the, uh, you know, the a BRT system through their development will, will accept their sort of plans. And I've, you know, actively said to them that, you know, continue to, to reach out to me directly and, you know, cause this is, this is important stuff, but it's also critically important that, that we get this system right. I think BRT is a huge piece of our, future transit system and this is the first one and it is critically important that 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 we do a uh, a, a great job and i think our our staff um heather Aldaf, Depp and her team who, who you all know well um is doing a, a fabulous job we're, we're about to finalize our 30 percent design and then get feedback from stakeholders on that so we're we're off and running all right good deal well, again, thank you. Um, I'll continue to talk with you guys offline about other Please. other other things. Um, glad to hear the elevator escalator rehabilitation. We're approaching 40% of the elevators mm -hmm. and 25, 21% of the uh, escalators being re rehabilitated. Um, our vertical transportation is just as is, is vital. I know. So, mm -hmm. thank you for that. And I'm sure that we will hear more related to Camelton Road and and the ART from Metropolitan and Cleveland, um, we know the status of those and uh, are excited to see those come up, come about. So thank you all. I have a uh, one yeah, thank you, which is Antonio Brown. Mr. Brown? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Mr. Parker, for your presentation. 
Um, You're very welcome. I, I just want to commend Marta for the work that you all have been doing uh, around the homeless issues um, that we've experienced, um, you know, from the airport uh, to uh, just the congregation on the uh, Martyr Transportation Services. You know, Melissa has been has done just an incredible job keeping me in the loop of, mm -hmm. you know, the changes that are being made. And I'm really excited to know that you all are standing up a, uh, a non-sworn police unit uh, to focus uh, on kind of curbing this issue where we can address mm -hmm. the mental health and the substance abuse issues that occur on MARTA um, and really provide them the assistance and the care services through Hope Atlanta um, to really get them into some kind of rehabilitation. And I think MARTA plays such a critical role in that work. Um, so I'm just so appreciative uh, to know that you all have stepped up and have really um, aligned your mission with ensuring that all of your passengers yeah. um, are reflect reflected in the work that MARTA does to help move our communities forward. So I really just wanted to say thank you so much for that. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. It's, it, you know, as, as we, we all agree, this is, this is important. This is, uh, you know, being, being humane with, with human beings. And, uh, you know, I also want to point out that, that this issue goes beyond our rail system. Um, if you move around our city, you will see bus shelters that are being used by unsheltered for shelter. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, we're, we're going to, uh, you know, work in, in those areas as well as our, our rail, uh, stations and, you know, you know, helping to, uh, to find resources for individuals who are, who are stuck in, in, uh, in bus shelters, but also making sure that the uh, the customers who use our bus shelters and you know want to get out of the rain on a rainy day have a, a you know a, a clean you know environment to uh, to stand out out of the rain. So we're you know we're, we're considering doing some things with with um, turning some of the benches into uh, leaning posts. Um, uh, you know, in, in conjunction with the outreach that, that we're, we've lined up in our bus shelters that, uh, that are just unfortunately being used for, uh, you know, by home, the homeless population. Yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate that. And I, I think this work, again, is, is, is extremely important. And um, I hope and I have faith that MARTA will continue to lead in these efforts um, to ensure that we don't run into any conditions like the ones we've seen before. So um, yeah. I'm just grateful. And uh, if I can be of Thank any you. assistance as we continue to move that, this forward, uh, any of us on council, please let us know. Yeah, yeah we, we will continue to have a, a good dialogue with, with you and, and your fellow council members about this important issue. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, next speaker is uh, council member Overstreet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Parker, I just didn't want to take this, uh, miss this opportunity to um, say thank you for the presentation, especially now that we're not able to uh, actually see you in person. I um, mm -hmm. want to let you know that I do appreciate the work that you are doing around the city, um, especially with all of this escalator and elevator talk. I believe that's where we met um, in presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yep. with, with all of this talk and, um, you know, really appreciate um, you letting us know the advances that you're making as well as just really knowing how important it is that that those things are, are at a priority uh, because of the people that it affects when, 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 they're, when they're not working. That's where we have to really um, put in that work, and, and that's what you're doing. And I appreciate Marta for that. And again, I also appreciate the uh, the work of your whole team because uh, they're very been very communicative about uh, the projects that are going on, not just in Southwest Atlanta, but all over. And um, you know, and and okay to to listen to recommendations and communication as Councilmember Dickens. 
uh, was saying, and uh, Councilmember Brown, I just appreciate all of the work and um, just want you to know that I am here as a resource. If there are any questions, if, um, you know, if, if some sector of, of um, my constituents uh, have a concern, I am so open to help uh, MARTA in any way. So thank just you. thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you for this presentation and I hope to see you soon. Thank you, likewise. All right, I, I don't see any other speakers. I assume that means they are in approval. So, Ms. Parker, thank you and your team. Um, yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, see, you, see you later. Yeah. All right, council members, now we have one more presentation. The Department of Aviation will come and uh, update us on the CARES Act funding and uh, the 60-day plan uh, related to that, and then we will go into, after that, we will go into our relatively short legislative agenda. So um, let's hear from our general manager of Hartsville Jackson Atlanta International Airport, John Selden. Good morning, Transportation Council. Uh, this is John Selden, the general manager of Hartsville Jackson Atlanta International Airport. And um, I'll, I'll first start out talking about our COVID-19 and roll into our CARES money, and then I'll roll into the uh, legislation uh, about uh, the individuals experiencing homelessness. So uh, right off the bat, I will tell you we're running between about 1,350 and 1,600 flights a day. We're TSA checkpoint volume, and normally we're up around 24 to 2,600 flights. Our TSA checkpoint volume is running between 18,000 passengers and 27,000 passengers. I will tell you, uh, if you're traveling September 4th, which is the Friday before Labor, or the Labor Day weekend, we expect over 37,000 at our checkpoint, which is about 40% of where it normally is for that day. So our passenger traffic is doing okay, and normally we run between um, pretty much 60,000 and 80,000 at our checkpoint. Um, so right now we probably have, and this is an extrapolated number, uh, somewhere between 90,000 to 110,000 passengers a day in our terminal, down from the average of around 300 and 310,000 a day. So we're, we're back a little bit. Our flights are back about 60% and our passengers are back about 35%. So um, we're holding our own and we're uh, very interested to see what happens uh, after the Labor Day weekend, and if our business travelers uh, return as the, some of the children go back to school, some may not, so I, we think that's going to impact some business travel going forward. And we'll see what happens um, as um, we get more and more uh, positive news about therapeutics and vaccines and plasma going forward. So it's going fairly well. We have uh, over, we started uh, COVID with about 5,000 masks provided by the federal government. We're handing out between 2,500 and 5,000 masks a day. Most people now have masks and they're just grabbing an extra mask as they go through the TSA checkpoint. And as you know, um, most of the airlines are, are requiring masks and if you don't wear a mask, you either are not granted boarding or you're escorted off the flight before it takes off or when it lands, um, airlines are ensuring that you don't fly the airline ever again. So um, those, those things are going forward, and we're still looking for federal guidance for a policy for air travel, not only for air travel, but for the airports and what's required across um, the system in the United States so a passenger has a consistent expectation of sanitary conditions and mask wearing and social distancing no matter where they go uh, when they travel domestically. Our international travel is also coming back. Um, we have numerous flights coming back throughout the next few months. Um, we're running Amsterdam and Paris and then Frankfurt and Johannesburg, London, uh, Lagos, uh, Munich, Barcelona, Dublin, Rome, Madrid, and Stuttgart. So plus our flights to Seoul and some Haneda in Japan flights are coming back. So we're looking pretty good. Things are, things are getting better. Air travel, um, if you follow the guidelines, is, is safe. Um, there are literally um, millions of people flying again. So we're, we're looking forward to a very steady, slow recovery. And with that, I'll talk about the past here, and uh, we'll go to us, um, our budget sheet. I think we can pull that up. I'm not sure. Let's see. Can Julia pull that up? 
think it was a handout. Okay, so maybe it's a handout. Um, but if you have our, our, the handout that we provided, our passenger traffic, we'll start with our fiscal year 20 budget, which is what we started before the pandemic. We were expecting about 55 and a half million employment, somewhere around 112 million passengers. Um, and then at our June presentation for our budget June this year, we brought that down to about 39 uh, million uh, employments, which double that is about 80 million passengers. And our end of our fiscal year uh, results were, we were a little over that, we were about 81 million passengers. So we did a really good job of forecasting the impact from a passenger perspective uh, for our fiscal year 20 budget. Um, and we forecasted a revenue uh, with the fiscal year 20 budget before COVID of 587 million. Uh, we revised that for our June presentation to tell you that it was going to be around 40, 438 million. We ended up at 431 million in revenue. We took um, significant hits in our terminal rental revenue because we abated excuse me, we deferred the payment. That was almost $90 million. We, our parking due to reduced parking in the quarter, uh, in, our, in the year brought us down $40 million. And we uh, reducing and um, relieving the MAG requirements for our concessionaires brought that revenue down about $34 million. So from our uh, budget uh, to where we are, we were down about $156 million for fiscal year 20. And um, from our forecast, though, of our budget presentation in June to, to where we were, oh, there we are, from our presentation in June, which is the second column, we were at 430 438 million, and we ended up at 431 million. A very good job by our CFO here, Greg Richardson, of forecasting where we were going to be. We were just under by about six and a half million in, in revenue. So we did a really good job of forecasting that and um, going forward. So net down 156 million. So let's go to the expense side. And for our expenses, um, we forecasted our, our total expenses of being about $343 million. When we presented our budget in June, we forecasted $285 million, and uh, we ended up at uh, $291 million, which was $6 million over where we thought we would be in June. And that was due to the implementation of hazard pay and COVID-19 expenses, mostly cleaning expenses, hand sanitizers, and, and implementation of all the, the things we did, the, the deep cleaning that we did in the terminal. So our total expenses um, were 291000 And this is our first application of CARES money. You'll see the line that says $34,836,000. And we applied that to our total expenses, and that brought our expenses down to $256,532. Um, and if you subtract that from the revenue in that actual line of 431, that gives us a net operating revenue of $175 million. Um, uh, with that came our debt service, which we have to uh, cover, which was 150,141,000. So if you take our debt service coverage at that point, we are, we're at about a 1.16 in debt service coverage, and we need to maintain 1.25% uh, debt coverage. So what we did at that point is we added another $46 million of CARES money to our debt service, which reduced it down to $104 million, and that brought us up to a uh, debt service of uh, 1.51, plus some extra uh, funding for flexibility. So the federal government back in March gave us 330, excuse me, first week of April, I think, 338 and a half million dollars. We've drawn down 80 million 881 thousand. So going into fiscal year 21, we have 256 million, 257 million dollars of CARES money to get us through the year. So now at this point, I'm going to turn it over to our CFO, Greg Richardson, and he'll talk about page two, which is our, our debt service uh, calculations. Go ahead, Greg. Thanks, John. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Greg Richardson, Deputy General Manager, CFO, Hartsfield Jackson, Atlanta International Airport. Um, the second page of, of this report um, is really what 
the the main focus was as we went into this COVID uh, environment. Um, as you can imagine, the the fourth quarter, leading into the fourth quarter, um, and all throughout the fourth quarter was a pretty fluid environment as to what we were doing with billing, what we were doing with receipts, and and everything that was going through as far as uh, operating the airport. And so our focus was to ensure that uh, we met our debt service coverage requirement of the 125. And so as you look at this page, um, and again, the, the other caveat to this is from a, our debt service is calculated based on a pure cash basis. So there's going to be differences between what you see on this page versus the page that John just went through. Um, so this is purely on a cash basis, which also kind of helps complicate the issue as far as trying to uh, project exactly what's going to happen for the fiscal year. Um, so as you can see, the operating revenue, uh, when we presented at budget, we had anticipated operating revenue on a cash basis to be $410 million. Mm-hmm. Actually came in at a little, uh, almost $411 million. So that was critical that, that we were close to that number. Uh, where, we, where we missed it as far as the projection was on the net operating expenses on a cash basis. And John alluded to some of those items there. Uh, we actually are about $20 million over as far as cash expenses. And again, that that will relate to a lot of the uh, accruals reversing and actual payments being made on the on the year and and things that really we we had not anticipated or were not calculating in our projections when we made them. Um, to offset that, I also knew that the investment income was not going to be zero, and so we we sort of held that back as a conservative approach to ensure that we were uh, protecting ourselves uh, from any any addition additional expenses or, or cash items that were coming through. So really, at the end of the day, our net revenue um, in fiscal year 20, what we presented was about 124.9 and came in at about 122.3. So all in all, we were we were pleased with where that came in. Um, but as I've told others internally, uh, at, before we got to the year end, I was getting nervous about where we were going to end from a pure cash perspective. And so when we made the presentation back with our budget, we had anticipated uh, drawing CARES funds in the aggregate of about $62.8 million. Uh, we decided to go ahead and make one final draw on our uh, debt service, our last month of debt service, just to have a little extra in the, in, the, in the pocket, which is why it went from basically the 63 to a little over $80 million. In that draw, what we did is we decided to split it both between operating and debt service. Um, that allows us some flexibility as we move forward but also provided, just from a pure math perspective, our ability to make our cover, our coverage of at least the 125. And so in in the actuals, instead of applying $63 million to operating expenses, we only applied 34 million. And then down at the GARB debt service, uh, we actually applied the 46 million, which allowed us to reach a coverage uh, right now preliminary of about uh, 1.5 times our revenue. So um, all in all, we're, we're right now pleased with, with where we are, um, you know, making the draw on the CARES um, provides us uh, some cash to cover for the first quarter of fiscal 21, um, and so because we won't make any draws on the care money, CARES money um, until we actually have incurred expenses uh, because it is a reimbursable agreement. Um, so we'll, we'll probably not make another draw from that until maybe the first quarter or the end of the first quarter into the second quarter. Um, and, and sort of make that uh, make that decision then. So uh, with that, I'll turn it back to John or over to the group for any questions. Okay, I'll uh, continue. I, while we're talking about COVID-19 and CARES money, I do want to mention that in our ATL Park Select, which is uh, off Riverdale Road and Sullivan Road, um, we have a mega testing site there that can do 5,000 COVID tests a day for free for Georgia residents. Um, It started August 10th. Right now it's running through September 11th. It may run into October. Um, The Georgia Department of Health is running it with the help of the federal government and uh, and Hartsfield-Jackson. We're providing the facility. So, uh, so far by us, they've given they've given almost 12,000 tests there since August 10th. Um, the tests take about five to ten minutes. You can make a reservation if you like online, and do the, uh, or you can just drive up and and go in. Um, it's well staffed, and uh, there's canopies to keep you out of the weather. And if you're interested, you do the you administer the test yourself, 
um, with a Q-tip in your nostril. And um, the results are generally back. Uh, we have people that have gotten results back within 24 hours and some as late as five, five days. So the results are fairly quick. Um, so if anybody's interested, take your family or go down to the park, uh, the ATL Select parking lot, and uh, we'll be, they'll be down there to take care of you. Um, so at this point, I'm going to transition, and then I guess we can go for questions. Uh, I want to thank City Council for the resolution to give the airport the flexibility in changing and amending the operating hours to address uh, individuals that are experiencing homelessness. Um, but we did quite a bit of research, and we've done quite well. And it, uh, I can't thank uh, Jeff and his team at MARTA enough for helping us provide services to these individuals uh, going forward. Uh, I know when you all came out here that night, we probably had almost 200 here in the building. I will tell you, we're averaging between 30 and 55 uh, individuals here at night. Um, and uh, the reason for that is MARTA is providing services to these people prior to getting to the airport. Um, but we looked at it holistically and we said, what is the reason why we still have 40 or 50 of them here, given that you've given us the flexibility to change the operating hours and possibly move some of these people out, these individuals out? Um, and what we found is, um, I'll just read you yesterday's report, um, we had 41 um, people uh, here overnight. The amount of people that got off the last three trains was 41. Hope Atlanta was working with those people, and so was uh, my staff of ATL enforcement and HSS security that do sweeps here, and we work with these people. But what we came to find out is the last northbound train, in other words, the train that leaves the airport and heads back to the city is at, at 1 a.m. There are three southbound trains that come in after that. So there's a southbound train at 1 14 a.m., 1.34 a.m., and 1.54 a.m., and all 41 of those individuals came in on those three trains. So by changing the hours, really, we felt was not going to provide us any benefit, even though we appreciate the flexibility. Um, but we found that these last three trains that come into Hartsville-Jackson, and then there is a train yard right across uh, 85 here, uh, those trains do not go north, they go into the train yard. So we're still working with MARTA and our team here to provide the services as best we can. Our goal is never to, to push somebody outside the building, for sure, is to keep them in the building. Um, and um, we are doing a really good job at doing that and keeping things safe and clean. And our numbers really are, are significantly better due to um, everyone's efforts. And I want to thank the MARTA team once again. And uh, our Hope Atlanta team here has placed seven individuals into shelters and actually found two of the people in the airport here in permanent housing. Uh, now, if there's any questions, that'll be great. All right, thank you very much. Our, uh, one of our speakers is uh, J.P. Mazakite. I'll let him go. Mr. Mazakite. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I had two questions with regard to the airport. Um, first off is um, how much of that CARES money do we have? And, um, you know, what's our, do we have enough CARES funds to offset our projected operating and debt coverage shortfalls? Um, so I'll just ask that one, and then I'll ask a follow-up question. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Councilman, this is Greg Richardson. Um, as it relates to monies received, um, again, I just want to remind everybody that the way the CARES Act um, is working for us, it is a pure reimbursable. So we have to first incur the expenses and then we submit those expenses for reimbursement. So at this point, the only monies that we have received are the um, $80.8 .8 million um, that was related to uh, end of year June 30. Projections for fiscal 21 um, right now have not fundamentally changed um, as it relates to what we presented for our fiscal 21 uh, budget. So we, we anticipate that with the remaining $257 million of CARES dollars available, um, that that will be really more than enough to cover what we anticipate to be our operating revenues and then whatever operating expenses um, that might exceed those revenues. So uh, where we might, where you'll see us using it most likely will be um, in debt service, um, which is what we talked about during the budget session. Uh, we'll We'll utilize it in debt service, which then um, 
um, carries back to the airlines from a rates and charges perspective, um, but then also on operating expenses. And then also the other reminder is when we talked about the budget back in June, uh, we really budgeted for um, almost full cost for running the airport. And so as the year progresses and is, if we see the um, activity not coming back the way we had anticipated, then we have the flexibility to reduce those expenses uh, and make sure that we're, we're matching um, our expenses with what that capacity number is. So uh, we're comfortable that the CARES money will carry us through uh, through fiscal 21 and most likely we'll have some balance remaining that can be utilized in fiscal 22. That, that's great to hear. Is there an end date to the CARES money, um, how long it, we can use it to reimburse expenses? Yeah, the way it was originally set up, it's a four-year period. Um, so as long as we use it within that time period. And, and we, right now, we've elected to use it for operating expenses and debt. There is, a, there is the ability to use it for a capital purpose. We have not elected for that yet. But as we talked about it during the budget session, is if things to return uh, quicker than we anticipate um, and we can find a use for it and we still have monies available and we decide not to use it for operating, that flexibility does exist. For us to utilize it from a capital perspective. It'll require us to do um, an amendment to the FAA as to the application itself, but it's, it's a possibility that exists should we need it. Great, thank you. Um, and, and second and final question really is about uh, capital uh, expenditure planning. The, the, the behaviors of, of all of us have been altered by COVID, um, you know, <laughs> teleworking and all these virtual meetings, uh, you know, there's speculation about what they that will do to, um, you know, everything from the real estate market to, um, you know, transportation, et cetera. Has the, the, the changes in customer behavior due to COVID um, changed any of your assumptions with regard to your capital plans? For example, you, you know, parking decks, the amount you might need, uh, terminal space, or at least the timing of when additional terminal space, uh, plane, train uh, capacity might be needed. Uh, what, what, if anything, has changed on the capital uh, planning side due to COVID? Thank you, Councilman Mayor. Guy John here. Um, we have not really changed too much. We've accelerated some of our programs as best we can due to the reduction in operations. But we, uh, prior to COVID, we had really, uh, we were, there was a plan to rebuild our garages and, and that was canceled, uh, pre COVID because of the Uber and Lyft effect. Um, and, uh, we are renovating the current ones that we have. Um, so we know parking, um, the future of parking is, is probably not the, the bright spot. So we were already addressing some of that. When it comes to terminal space, um, I, our, the aviation industry and, and my fellow uh, airport CEOs all believe that um, we're going to get back to normal with a vaccine, and, and this, this uh, we will we will look back maybe two three years from now or somewhere in that range, and uh, not build enormous head houses or terminals to support social distancing due to. Um, uh, 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 antibodies, um, uh, therapeutics, and a, and a vaccine. Uh, we really believe we will eventually get back to normal um, and to spend millions and millions of dollars to uh, accommodate uh, substantial growth to provide the spacing. Uh, I don't think we're there yet. Uh, obviously, we'll have to see what the future holds. Um, but we're, we're not there yet. As you know, we're making our train uh, much faster, which is going to give us a 20% increase in capacity. We're building five gates over on the T-South complex. So we're, we're looking forward to the future and building capacity and resiliency in here at Hartsfield-Jackson, and we're building efficiencies in by building our end-around taxiway at 9 left. And we're, you'll hear later to this morning that we're going to build a de-icing pad uh, to provide all-weather capabilities to make us even more resilient and more efficient here at Hartsfield-Jackson. So we really have not looked at it as changing the physical layout of the airport. Uh, going forward so far. Yeah, thank you. Um, it, w it would be interesting to see, and I guess we'll, we'll just kind of have to um, wait and see 
the impact uh, on travel and how quickly that will come back. Um, as businesses uh, see, you know, the um, uh, decrease in their expense load that can be had by reducing travel, having more telework meetings, you know, all of these things that are happening right now out of necessity, it, it'll be interesting to see what of those will um, carry forward and how that will impact um, the airport. I, I think that um, it, it, it will be a long time before we get back to um, normal or, or previous levels, not because of COVID reasons, but because of changes in behavior um, amongst our customers, but that remains to be seen. So just would ask that you, uh, as I'm sure you will, kind of keep your eye on that and, and think about what changes may occur uh, to your customers and how that might impact your capital planning. Thank you very much. I appreciate your presentation. Thank you. All right. Thank you both. Uh, I don't see any other comments from other council members. Uh, speak now or forever. Hold your peace until we vote. Um, okay. Seeing none, thank you. Uh, stand by. Uh, General Manager Selden, stand by for when we have the legislative items before us. Roger that, sir. All right. Ms. Pulandini, let's move to the consent agenda. Yes, Mr. Chair, item number one, 20-0-1562, an ordinance by Transportation Committee to correct ordinance number 16-0-1433, adopted by the Atlanta City Council on September 6, 2016, and approved by operation of law on September 15, 2016, on behalf of the Atlanta Department of Transportation, for the purpose of adding an additional funding source for the purchase of permanent and temporary construction easements and necessary rights of way from various property owners for the completion of the Martin Luther King Drive Complete Street Retrofit, all other provisions to remain unchanged and for the purposes. And item number 220-0-1563, an ordinance by Transportation Committee authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to amend the FY2021 Airport Renewals and Extension Fund budgets by adding to anticipations and appropriations grant funds in the amount of $33,238,956.00 from the Federal Aviation Administration for grant agreement 3-13-0008-122-2020 for the reconstruct taxiway E, taxiway L, taxiway H, taxiway F, dash 4,800 and improve runway 9L-27R dash RSA projects and further purposes. Okay. Thank you for those first reads. We will accept both of them. Now let's move into our uh, ordinance for second read. Item number three, 20-0-1541, an ordinance by Transportation Committee authorizing the mayor on behalf of the city of Atlanta to enter into an agreement for a term of five years with the Georgia Department of Revenue to pay $1 for each motor vehicle record requested for use in a touchless payment option for public parking lots at Hartsville jackson atlanta International Airport and for the purposes. And there is an amendment in your packet which replaces references to the Georgia Department of Transportation with the Georgia Department of Revenue in the body of the legislation. Okay. I make a motion that we approve the amendment. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Okay. I, actually, I should have said accept the amendment. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that was Dickens' uh, motion and seconded by Faroki. Let's prepare a vote on bringing forth the amendment. The vote is open. Mr. Brown, you can give us your voice voice vote. Affirmative. Vote is closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. Item has been amended. Okay, Mr. Sheldon, please tell us about the uh, motor vehicle um, record to go to the airport parking. Yes, sir. John Selden, Hartsfield Jackson General Manager. Um, this is part of our pay system that we're using, touchless, frictionless pay system in our brand new ATL West Garage, which is the 5,800 parking space uh, over in College Park 
uh, by our G, by the GICC and our SkyTrain station. Um, so what we're doing is we're, if you have a license plate, and, and this is just one of the ways that we're going to uh, collect funds, um, you can use your peak paths, you can make a reservation and pay in advance, you will be able to drive in and drive out frictionlessly with no cash here. So um, the system is going to be set up so that if you drive up in your car, we are going to take a picture of your license plate, you're going to park, and then when you go to the exit, we're, even if you haven't paid or have a peach pass or are going to pay us later via the app or pay on foot before you leave, uh, the gate is going to go up and we're going to get your license plate leaving. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we have this agreement with the Georgia Department of Revenue. We're going to send them a spreadsheet um, every day, with uh, every two business days, excuse me, with a list of the people who have not paid, and we are going to get their vehicle registration information and uh, cover this dollar plus a little other um, cost in administrative of mailing a bill to the individual who's registered for the vehicle, and hopefully they will send us a check, and this will be done by our contractor. Um, so this is one of the ways you can just drive in and drive out, and if you want to pay later, it'll be a couple dollars more uh, than what the bill was, but this, this provides a frictionless experience for you um, going forward. And then um, I will say, if you don't pay then, when you come back for your second time, when you drive in, we'll let you in again. And then when you get to the gate the, for the second time, if you, if you owe us money, we will have an individual there meet you at the gate with a, um, probably an iPad that you can pay via credit card uh, to get out of the garage. Thank you. All right. Cue the George Jetson music. Uh, <laughs> we, are in the, we are now in the future. Um, are there any questions or comments by council members? Uh, Seeing none, I will make a motion to approve as amended. Is there a second? Second, Brown. Second. All right, we'll go with Brown. That's his voice vote. So that's his second. Let's vote. Vote is open. Vote is closed. Seven years down eight. This item is favorable as amended. Item four, 20 0 1542, an ordinance by Transportation Committee authorizing the mayor of a designee on behalf of the city of Atlanta to enter into amendment number one for contract SB 10174, apply for technology LLC special procurement agreement for online equipment system for a month to month extension not to exceed six months in accordance with section 2 1163, subsection C. Article 10 of the Procurement and Real Estate Code of the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinances to add funding in an amount not to exceed $141,000.00, all contracted work to be charged to and paid from funding numbers listed herein and for other purposes. All right. Um, who's going to speak to this? Um, this is Katina Alexander with, with um, ACLDOT. Apply for is our, per our online permitting system that's used for the franchise utility permits as well as all of our right of way permits such as lane closures and sidewalk closures. Um, this is a, an, a renewal for another year so that we can continue to use this product as the city tries to find a global product for everyone to be on the same permitting database. Okay. All right. Are there any comments or questions from? Council members regarding this new technology. All right, I make a motion to. Well, are we referring this, Miss um, Pulladini? Uh, yes, Mr. Dickens. After the committee makes a recommendation, they'll have to vote to refer this to FEC. Okay. So first, okay. So, the vote will be on the. All right. So I will uh, make a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second, Brown. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Let's prepare a vote. Vote is open. Mr. Westmoreland, how do you vote? Oh, Sorry. In favor. 
Vote is closed. 78 we are in eight. This item is capable. Okay, so now we need to make a motion to refer it. Is that correct? Yes, sure. That's correct. And we're just referring it to FEC? That's correct. All right, I make a motion to refer it to FEC. Is there a second? Second, Westmoreland. All right, let's vote. Vote is open. And Mr. Brown, how do you vote? Affirmative. Thank you. Vote is closed, seven yeas, zero and eight. This item will be referred to the Finance Executive Committee. Next item is number five, 20-0-1559, an ordinance by Council Members Howard Shook and Jennifer N. Ide, authorizing the mayor who does his need to install traffic calming devices on North Pelham Road Northeast to waive certain provisions of section 138-84D of the City of Atlantic Code of Ordinances and for the purposes. Ms. I, do you want to speak to this or? Sure. Um, this is a neighborhood street that back when we, the city did some construction for a safe route to school, um, project several years ago, it really changed the traffic flow and they got a lot of more cut through traffic and then when the 85 bridge collapsed, they became a real, um, very much a cut through and it's residential with small children on both sides. There's been a number of close calls of people being hit and then the neighborhood collected the 911 reports of cars being hit, which included a city of Atlanta vehicle. Um, so people are just driving too quickly through there. We have um, communicated with um, ADOT about this just being a continuing issue and, you know, we're, we're one, <laughs> we are one step away from something worse than um, a resident's car being totaled by a city of Atlanta employee. So um, it needs to have some traffic calming. Okay. I agree. All right. Sounds like a... Motion from I, yes? Yes. <laughs> All right, and I will, uh, is there a second? I'll second it, Dickens. Let's prepare a vote. Vote is open. Mr. Brown, how do you vote? Affirmative. Vote is closed. 7808, this item is favorable. Item number six, 20-R-4263, a resolution by Councilman Barandrea Elgun, requesting the Commissioner of the Atlanta Department of Transportation to conduct a traffic study of Gary Avenue Southwest and for other purposes. Move approval. Okay. Yes, All right, is there a second? Second, Brown. All right, let's vote. Vote is open. Vote is closed, 7808, this item is favorable. Item number seven, 20-R-4264, a resolution by Council Member Amir Afroki directing, directing the Office of Innovation Delivery and Performance to work with the Atlanta Department of Transportation to prepare a multi-year payment plan to holistically and responsibly pay down the city's sidewalk, repair backlog, and fund new construction and for other purposes. And there is an amendment in your packet to replace the word directing with requesting in the caption and in the results clause. Okay, um, Mr. Faroki. Uh, thank you, Chairman Dickens. Uh, first, I want to move uh, to amend the paper as uh, it's included in the in the packet we have. This is simply correct the legislation uh, to fall in line with our. Uh, capacity as a council to request action from the city department not to direct a city department to act in a certain way. So um, this is a resolution, so therefore it requests that the city department of transportation uh, and other um, offices work toward articulating a, a long-term funding plan for sidewalk repair and expansion across the city. Uh, so before there's any further conversation, I'd like to just move to amend the paper to make that change. Second, Brown. Right. Okay, good. So we have a motion. I'm sorry, I heard someone else talking. 
No, that was just oh. Councilman Rover Street. I was just second, and but Brown did, and that's fine. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So uh, we have a motion by Faroki and a second by Brown for the amendment. Let's vote on the amendment. The vote is open. Vote is closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. This item has been amended. Okay. So, Mr. Faroki, you are still on the floor, and then I'll go to Ms. Overstreet. Okay. Thank you, Chairman Dickens. So this um, resolution is part of a, a bigger conversation that we have been having as a council and as a city uh, with respect to sidewalks, but really with respect to infrastructure writ large, including streets. I know Council Member Matsukai has a similar um, paper regarding uh, funding for our streets uh, repairs. Um, so all this goes to say this, this resolution asks the City Department of Transportation and the Office of Innovation Delivery to um, work to deliver a proposed funding framework for addressing the city's sidewalk repair backlog as well as, as, well as the um, expansion, sidewalk expansion needs for the city. Uh, yesterday in a memo um, to all of us, uh, the Commissioner of Department of Transportation indicated uh, finally, after two and a half years of asking uh, what that sidewalk backlog uh, is. Uh, it is roughly $250 million for repairs and another $500 million for, um, for expansion. So kind of a two to one expansion for repair. Uh, need and that's on the low end. It's not in taking into account right of way issues, watershed issues, other kind of structural impediments that may come into play when expanding sidewalks or repairing them. So that $750 million is a, a it's the low end of what we are facing and does not also account for the kind of updated maintenance for any sidewalks that are in place or are built. So the number is potentially well over a billion dollars. Um, and this is a problem that many other cities have faced. Uh, many other cities have taken to finding ways to address it, usually over 10 to 30 years, uh, through a range of approaches. And this resolution simply asks um, our city DOT and the Office of uh, Office of Innovation Delivery to spend some time um, thinking about what that could look like uh, over the next uh, decade or two, and then come back to us so we can continue to have a conversation as to how we fund these. And this should not be this legislation specific to sidewalks. Obviously, we have other infrastructure needs that require, I think, the same level of attention and, and assertiveness. So uh, I'm hoping this um, uh, finds favor with all of us uh, on the committee. It's, there's nothing really controversial about it, just asking us to dig deep and then come up with a plan for how we want to address this and advance the conversation around uh, sidewalks in the, in the city, uh, in every neighborhood in the city. Uh, so with that, I will move to approve. Second, all right. Brown. Okay, so uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Baroque, for those comments. Thank you for that motion. And second, we will hold a, a round for your second. Let's hear from other speakers before we vote. Ms. Uh, Carl, your overstreet. Yes, thank you, Chair Dickens. Um, I just really wanted to speak about the importance of sidewalks. Um, I know that I, I feel like I'm going to leave office um, being the sidewalk girl, and that's fine with me. Uh, so I did read the memo from Commissioner Rowan, and I did like the part where he mentioned that sidewalks will be viewed from an equitable lens with the one Atlanta, as well as the safety lens with our Vision Zero. All of that is very important and extremely, um, you know, necessary for for us as a city. Um, and I just don't think that we could have enough sidewalk talk, like especially, um, well, you know, expansion as well as as uh, maintenance. Uh, we do need specific legislation that speaks to exactly how we're going to accomplish our sidewalk dilemma, um, taking care of it. So um, I'm going to support the paper. I, um, I would like to see exactly uh, how Vision Atlanta, I mean, Vision Zero and One Atlanta will address our sidewalk issues. Um, so it's just a resolution. So this is just us saying that this is something that we, we actually need to do is to prioritize exactly how we're dealing with our sidewalks. 
uh, situation and um, the mounting um, complications and the mounting uh, uh, vast numbers of, of, of dollars that it's going to take us to take care of our, our situation or get it uh, somewhere under control. Um, I do appreciate the studies that we've done on it to capture exactly where our issues are. That was a nice beginning, and I just want to continue on with this same conversation. I know that t spice is going to be uh, up soon, and I just want to make sure that we're having a sidewalk conversation um, going forward with any tax dollars that we're thinking about capturing. We, we need to be specific about uh, taking care of the people that are actually walking in the street to uh, get on, mass, uh, on our MARTA system because they have to, because they don't have cars, and they have to get to work. Um, so we do have a sidewalk issue that we have to address, and um, I think this paper does help with that. All of it helps. So I'm always open to having this conversation. Um, just like, you know, at this time, I'm also asking for a five, ten-year study on how parks and recs um, deals with maintenance and and um, growth. It's just something I think as a city, we should always have a rhyme and a reason. We need to know exactly what we're doing and why. So um, thank you um, for allowing me to speak about this. I uh, just want everyone to, to know that I'm always going to be in support of sidewalk conversation, especially when we're talking about uh, installation you know um, expansion of our sidewalk system where we really need it badly people are walking very dangerously and that's a matter of data like that's that's not just us thinking that it's happening it's 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 captured it's, it's public it's 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 something that we know is happening so that's my um conversation on that thank you all right, thank you, Ms. Overstreet. Next, we will go to J.P. Mathekai. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and as uh, Council Member Faroki mentioned, um, well, uh, first off, I am in support of this. I think that we have to have this conversation about investing in our sidewalk infrastructure. Uh, I also do have... Um, uh, legislation that I'll be introducing to have a, a similar conversation about investment in our our city roads. Um, and uh, <laughs> Commissioner Rowan may may uh, correct me with all of the details, but um, you know our spending outside of Renew is uh, you know on about a hundred year replacement cycle for roads that last, um, you know, 20 to 25 years. And so we have a very similar conversation that we need to have with regard to our roads. I think, um, you know, spending on our transportation infrastructure uh, to me is one of the highest priority things that the city can do. Uh, and we need to have a serious conversation about um, how we're going to do it because the dollars are, are large. If we look at the sidewalk and the road infrastructure, um, you, you know, we're well over a billion dollars in what's needed for our uh, infrastructure. And so we're going to have to get creative and we're going to have to do some things to, to be sure that, that we can generate the kind of revenue that is needed to invest in our infrastructure. Um, so I, I hope that we have that conversation and, and put all of the uh, ideas on the table, outside funding, um, yes, cordon pricing, the, the C word. We need to have that discussion about uh, how we um, be sure that everybody using the roads um, and, and uh, is able to contribute to maintaining them. Um, so, uh, again, I, I will be introducing legis similar legislation to Mr. Brokies that deal with road infrastructure um, investment as well, and hopefully we can have this conversation in a larger context about how we're going to do this over the long term. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. All right, good deal, uh, Mr. Uh, Faroki. I see you're back on the speakers list. Is that just from your old 
speaker button. Yeah, I, I um, yeah, nothing else to add right at this moment. All right, Mr. Brown. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you so much to council member Perroki. Um, I expressed to be an email earlier today. I appreciate your courage to push through the status quo, to have a very real conversation for us to move into a place of change through the city's action to fix these sidewalk issues. Um, I personally don't, uh, my opinion in regards to not just this legislation, but the issue as a whole, uh, the city should have always taken responsibility for our sidewalks and not pan off the accountability to our taxpayers that pay their taxes so we can address our crumbling infrastructure. You know, this issue affects seniors. It affects the disabled in wheelchairs. Um, I mean, I run into so many issues um, in my district from seniors not being able to, you know, drive their wheelchairs you know, to get to where they need to get to, or they're afraid that they're gonna get hurt or, or, or something bad's gonna happen. Um, and, you know, I, I absolutely adore Commissioner Rowan and his entire team. I think the work that they do is incredible and necessary, you know, but I'm also tired of these memos that keep coming out in opposition of council members' legislation, especially you know, this one, this is a resolution. Why, why, why can't the administration stand behind this resolution and support it? Something that's so important and significant within this city. So, you know, I'm really tired of these memos that keep coming out um, every time a council member tries to do something. And, you know, I guess, you know, folks aren't the first to do it, so it's an issue with it. So, you know, I really appreciate you, Council Member Faroki. This is the work that matters. This is the change that we need in this city, and I appreciate you pushing this through. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you, Mr. Brown. Appreciate your um, comment. Let's see if uh, Ms. Ms. Overstreet has asked me to ask Mr. Rowan to speak. Um, Mr. Rowan, are you on the call, and are you interested in um, making a comment related to this paper? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just, just addressing the last comments first, this is actually the first memo that I have sent to Transportation Committee, and the intent was to quantify the, the, the demand, very similar to the activity that I've had with Councilmember Matzegeit when talking about paving. Um, one, one thing is for certain, in, in all 12 districts, I've never had anyone say we have too many sidewalks or we don't, we have too much paving. And so I think it's important as we try to solve these problems to understand scale and order of magnitude. This is not a $7 million problem. This is not something that's going to come out of our fiscal 2021 20, general fund budget. And I've been very clear that my personal priorities are safety. Safety first, that's why we push Vision Zero right out of the chute. I've also talked a lot about state of good repair and we'll be talking more about our sidewalks, our streets. We haven't even gotten into the conversation about bridges and culverts. So we, we have a heavy lift when it comes to state of good repair. I really commend council members Massaguide and Faroki for continuously pushing me because the, the conversation about funding is, is going to be a difficult one. It's going to take us to areas that we haven't considered before and that we need to consider. And so I, I'm not saying that we're necessarily supporting any of these, but we need to discuss them. And, and because really the, the, the state of good repair and the safety and, and the promotion of transit within a growing urbanizing area are, are extremely important to Atlanta. And, and I think that's really the, the big purpose behind DOT and, and our strategic plan. And so there, there's nothing to say that we disagree with Councilman Faroki. We're, we're eager to collaborate with him and we have a great working relationship with his office as well as we do everybody on this committee. But we've got a, we've got a tough task ahead of us. And, and everybody deserves to have safe streets. And, and just period, I'm gonna leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rowan, for um, your comments and stepping in. Um, Amir Faroki, I see your name back to speak. Did you want to speak again? 
I do, Chairman. I'll, I'll be brief. I want to thank you, Mr. Rowan, for his remarks. Look, I think we all share uh, an understanding and desire to um, pay more attention to our infrastructure, uh, whether it's a bridge, a culvert, a road, a sidewalk, a sewer system, whatever it may be. Um, and uh, I think a lot of this uh, legislation, whether on sidewalks or otherwise, comes from a place of um, I think long-standing frustration that the city really hasn't made it a priority to be proactive on on maintaining and building out its infrastructure. And this is true with cities across the country. I mean, a lot of especially Sunbelt cities, which exploded in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, are now having to deal with infrastructure issues that older New England cities and, and others have dealt with previously or, or um, are finding the same challenges. So all that goes to say, um, I think this this resolution, Council Member Massey's spending resolution, I think is part and parcel of a moment in the city in which we have to say, okay, we can't just do this every year uh, kind of by the seat of our pants, and sometimes we have a peace spot, sometimes we don't. I really have to be concerted and detailed and thoughtful in how we plan this out over the decades, knowing that there's competing demands for the public dollars, and there, there will be difficult conversations. So I appreciate uh, Commissioner Rowan putting up the number in the memo of, you know, at the very least $750 million needed for sidewalk work, both expansion and repair, and that's at the low end um, over the coming decades. And so I think while that's a daunting number, um, we need to start working on how, how we find funding streams and mechanisms to pay for that and streets and everything else. And so this resolution is intended really to, to push us in that direction. And I, I don't think any of us are pointing fingers at one another or at odds over this. I think it's just really a call to action. And I hope we can all um, work together on this and the streets and others. So um, thank you, Commissioner, for, for your remarks and to my colleagues for their attention to this issue as well. Good deal. Well, I'm glad we talked through this. Um, you know, I'll be voting in support of it as well. And, as, as, you know, from what I hear, it sounds like we'll be moving forward with this favorably. Um, I think it does highlight uh, the importance of, and I'll say this to you, Mr. Rowan, um, and to the administration. I think it continues to, right now in this format of committee meetings with us being in uh, virtual and COVID times, it, you know, the one Atlanta transit plan, that you, uh, transportation plan that you mentioned, as well thought out as those things are and moving forward, I guess we need to constantly be in communication about certain specifics of each of those plans. And that goes to all of these uh, kind of plans that are coming out of one Atlanta. They highlight high level and suggestions that and recommendations that no one disagrees with but the people that are kind of on the ground like the council members continue to get conversations and and uh, observations in the community that then drives for action and so don't be surprised when we have these type of actions that are taking place to move things forward um so i just would suggest that we figure out more specificity related to items that people are living day to day sidewalks dollars you know this was this comes with the conversations we've had for before there was Atlanta Department of Transportation there you know before we decided to create that I had a conversation in so many transportation meetings about citizens should have a general number that they walk around with related to sidewalk it's four hundred dollars for you know three feet of sidewalk it's you know x million dollars per mile of repaving uh, or milling and repaving i mean and it's not to hold us to a number but you have some general magnitude so you understand when budget times come around when when you see activity on the street you kind of get to know oh that's where the money is that if I look at that road, that road is about a mile. I can tell you about how much that costs in, in, in proximity. Now, some folks feel like citizens having that level of information is dangerous. <laughs> but I'll tell you that it's important to have it because, they, you know, this is a wise public, and they continue to challenge the closest person to them. And a lot of times that's a council member um, or particularly a district rep. So, um, you know, let's just figure out how to – 
bring these conversations down to the base level. Now that we have these high recommendations and we have these uh, goals, um, you know, council members are not trying to do the work of the the subject matter experts that are under the Atlanta Department of Transportation by any means, but to have some specificity helps us in our decision making around budgets and prioritizations that aid you guys and what y'all do so well. So those are my comments on that. Um, Mr. Faroki, I'll let you do the honor of making a recommendation uh, based on the amendment before us. Yeah, I think I I moved at the start at the top to oh yeah you did prove and I, yeah, and I, I believe agree. Council Member Brown seconded yeah. Yep, yep. Actually, so yes, Ms. Uh, Pulladini, let's pre uh, prepare to vote. One moment, please. Yeah. Council Member Dickens, uh, my computer just knocked me off, so I'll be voice voting, please. Vote is open. So, Ms. Overstreet, what was your voice vote? Affirmative. Okay. Got you recorded. The vote is closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. This item is favorable as amended. Our next right. item is number... All right. Item number 8, 20-R-4297. A resolution by Transportation Committee authorizing the mayor or designee on behalf of the Department of Transportation to enter into a memorandum of understanding with Fulton County Government for the purpose of granting a permit to its employees, contractors, and representatives in order to provide the county representatives with certain rights for the purposes of in to install and maintain wayfinding signage within the right-of-way in the government district area and for the purposes. All right. Is this uh, going to be Cotina? Uh, Alexander, or is this Mr. Rowan? Who are we? This is Cosina Alexander. Um, the purpose of this legislation is to allow Fulton County to install and maintain wayfinding signs around their government buildings around downtown. We have reviewed the packet and are okay with moving the legislation forward. All right, I make a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second, Brown. All right, we have a second. Let's prepare a vote. Ms. Overstreet and Mr. Westmoreland, or I see Mr. Westmoreland just voted. Ms. Overstreet, how do you vote? Affirmative. Ms. Pulladini, I see the uh, results. Uh, one moment, please. Um, unfortunately, I can't see the screen, Mr. Chair. If you wouldn't mind sounding the yep. final vote. Yes, uh, this is favorable, seven yeas, zero nays. Um, you want me to go to the next item, or you can do this? I, I can read the next item. Thank you. Okay. Item number 9, 20-R-4298, a resolution by Transportation Committee to fund enabling work of the Plain Train Tunnel West Extension project number, project under project number SB-9277, Plain Train Tunnel West Extension, Phase 1, progressive design build at Hartford West and Atlanta International Airport, which Clark Atkinson Technique, a joint venture comprised of Clark Construction Group, LLC, Atkinson Construction and Technique Concrete Construction, LLC, in an amount not to exceed $10 million in zero cents for construction services. All contracted work will be charged to and paid from account numbers listed herein and for other purposes. Mr. Selden. Yes, Mr. Chairman. John Selden, the general manager of Hartsfield Jackson. Um, this is part of our uh, plane train uh, acceleration program and car additional car program. Uh, the train is going to run faster, so we're going to need ver more vertical circulation. When you get off the train at the baggage claim, you know we have three escalators with the enormous uh, Barco wall with uh, the pictures up there of the president and Ludacris and the sports athletes. We're going to add a fourth elevator there to handle the additional volume and passengers we expect 
going forward. This project will complete in early 2023. The total cost is over $250 million. Um, and to do that, to build that escalator, we now do employee screening over by the TGI Fridays in the uh, West Crossover in the atrium. Uh, and uh, down to our mezzanine level where the um, employees are screened. So to facilitate putting the escalator in, we have to take out the employee screening. And this $10 million will provide for the vertical circulation and the relocation of employee screening. We're going to move it to the American Airlines baggage claim, which is on the lower level of our north concourse. And um, the American uh, Airlines passengers will then get their bags in carousel seven and eight in the normal baggage claim area upstairs. So this is this money is for that work, and we are looking on schedule and uh, looking ready to go. Thank you. All right, thank you. I make a motion to approve. Is there a second? <laughs> second, Brown. All right, thank you, Mr. Brown. Let's prepare our vote. The vote is open. Uh, Ms. Overstreet, how do you vote? Affirmative. Thank you. Vote is closed. 7808, this item is favorable. Our next item is number 10, 20-R-4299. A resolution by Transportation Committee authorizing the mayor of the designee to execute an agreement with Archer Western Lewis Contracting JV for project number ISD-3-1200348 South the Icing Complex ramp in an amount not to exceed $99,255,995.85 at Hartsville Jackson Atlanta International Airport. All services will be charged to and paid from accounts listed herein and for the purposes. And there's an amendment in your packet which attaches the independent procurement review office report. Okay, let's, um, I will make a motion to amend. Is there a second? Second, Brown. Or Brown, let's Brown. prepare the vote. Let's prepare the vote amendment. With, uh, Brown at the second. Vote is open. Ms. Overstreet, how do you vote? Affirmative. Vote is closed, 7808. This item has been amended. Okay. Um, are you ready to speak on this one, Mr. Sheldon? Yes, I am, sir. Yes, sir. Um, this is our south de-icing pad for uh, almost $100 million for Archer Western Lewis Joint Venture. Uh, we've been to city council earlier for $29 million for the building uh, that will house the crews that will do the de-icing, provide a training facility and break rooms for them. Um, this is over on our south airfield by the south cargo area. This is a 40-acre ramp uh, currently at Hartsfield-Jackson. We have 16 de-icing pads with only three of them are able to handle the large 747 800s and the A350s, A380s, excuse me. Uh, this pad will give us the capacity to do 10 more 737 A321 type airplanes or five uh, group five, which are the big 747 800s and A380s. Um, this will improve our efficiency and resiliency during storms, which will increase the probability that Hartsfield-Jackson will once again be the most efficient airport in North America year after year for 18 years in a row. This will take about 610 days for us to build, and we're looking forward to having this finished uh, by the end of uh, March in 22, and hopefully for the de-icing season uh, of the winter of 20, early 2022, so we can get our airplanes de-iced. And, and as you know, when it snows here in, in Georgia, it is, it is quite an event, and uh, it causes massive delays, and this is one of the projects that's going to improve, improve our resiliency. Thank you. All right, I make a motion to approve as amended. Is there a second? Second, Kate Brown. All right, Mr. Brown, thank you. Let's vote. 
Vote is open. Ms. Overstreet, how do you vote? Affirmative. Okay, thank you. Seven yeas, zero nays. This item is favorable as amended. Item number 11, 20-R-4300, a resolution by Transportation Committee authorizing the mayor, her designee, to enter into agreement RFP-S-1200-287, operation and management of common use facilities and equipment at Hartsville Jackson Atlanta International Airport with TBI ATL Operations Baby. On behalf of the Department of Aviation, for the total management fee over the initial five-year term, not to exceed $8.5 million in zero cents. All contracted work will be charged to and paid from accounts with the hearing and for other purposes. All right, Mr. Selden. Yes, sir. So uh, TBI is our current operator, and this is for concourses E and F in our international side of our airport. They also do our baggage claim on our north side uh, of the terminal here. Uh, it's five years current term for $8.5 million. They, they provide the operation and maintenance of the facilities. Um, and the $8.5 million is the controllable expenses here that we have, customer service uh, positions, interpreters, and all of that uh, part of it. Uh, the, the contract provides for them to schedule the use of our common gates, which is 40 of them. They run our baggage claims. They provide support to Customs and Border Protection. They control the airplanes on the ramps, uh, ramps uh, for the concourses E and F. They also assist due to our customer service requirements in those international terminals and baggage claim. Um, they follow, they also provide, uh, manage the operation and maintenance of all of the common use equipment, which are the terminals and ticket counters over in our international terminal. Um, they do a good job for us and we're looking forward to moving this forward. Thank you. All right. Motion to approve. Okay. okay. We have a motion to approve by Master Kite. Is there a second? Over Street second. Okay. Let's prepare our vote. Vote is open. Mr. Brown, how do you vote? Affirmative. Okay, good. I got all votes in. Uh, Ms. I. Ms. Ide, how do you vote? Okay. I don't see Ms. Ide on the system, and she's not able to respond with the phone. Uh, let's, let's go ahead on the marker away until we hear back from her. One oh, moment, please. There, there the is. vote is closed. Six days, zero nays. This item is favorable. Items 12 to 17 are all resolutions supplementing task order funds. Would the committee like to take these as a block? Items 12 to 17. I'm sorry. I was. Can you respond again? I was working on Ms. Ives. Uh, uh, sure. Items item 12 to 17 are all resolutions to supplement task order funds. Would the committee like to take these as a block? Yes, we will. All right. Item number 12, 20-R-4301, a resolution by Transportation Committee supplementing a task order fund in an amount not to exceed $8,152,000.00 for use under contract number FC-8640, Construction Management Support Services at Hartsville Jackson Atlanta International Airport, with ATL Construction Management Partners, a joint venture comprised of CH2M Hill, Inc., Rohat Fox Construction Control Services Corporation, and Parsons Transportation Group, Inc., to provide construction management support services for the Department of Aviation on a task order basis. All services will be charged to and paid from account numbers with the herein and for the purposes. Item number 13, 20-R-4302, a resolution by Transportation Committee supplementing a task order fund in an amount not to exceed $1 million in zero cents for use under 
at C-10322 on call comprehensive environmental services at Hartville Jackson Atlanta International Airport with environmental solution for the airport joint venture comprised of ACOM Technical Services Inc. and Edward Pittman Environmental Inc. for the Department of Aviation on a task order basis. All services will be charged to in case some account numbers listed herein and for the purposes. Item number 14, 20-R-4303. A resolution by Transportation Committee supplementing the task order fund in an amount not to exceed five million five hundred twenty-nine thousand six hundred forty-six dollars and zero cents for use under the airfield markings for con contract number SC-8927, airfield markings at Hartfield Jackson Atlanta International Airport. It's a highlight airfield services LLC for the Department of Aviation. On a task order basis, all services will be charged to and paid from account numbers listed herein and for the purposes. Item number 15. 20-R-4304, a resolution by Transportation Committee supplementing the task order funds in an amount not to exceed $1 million in zero cents for use under contract number FC-9211, Landside Electrical at Hartfield Jackson Atlanta International Airport with Brooks Ferry, Haney and Associates, Inc. For the Department of Aviation on a task order basis, all services will be charged to and paid from the account numbers with the herein and for the purposes. Item number 16, 20-R-4305, a resolution by Transportation Committee Supplementing a joint task order fund in an amount not to exceed $3 million and zero cents for use under contract number FC-9000 planning support services at Hartfield Jackson Atlanta International Airport with RNA TCE joint venture comprised of Wakondo and Associates Inc. and the Creative Eye LLC to provide planning support services for the Department of Aviation on a task order basis. All services will be charged to and take from account numbers with the herein and for the purposes. Item number 17, 20-R-4306, resolution by transportation committee supplementing a joint tax order fund in an amount not to exceed $13,097,000 in zero cents for use under four architectural and engineering design services contracts for contract number FC-9938A, HKSFC S&W joint venture comprised of HKS Inc., Fitzgerald Collaborative Group LLC, and Stevens and Wilkinson GA, Inc., FC-9938-B, Corgan Good Van Slyke Architecture Joint Venture comprised of Corgan and Associates Inc. and Good Van Slyke Architecture LLC, FC-9938 C Aviation Infrastructure Solutions, a joint venture comprised of Condon Company, Michael Baker International Inc. and Corporate Environmental Risk Management, and FC-9938 C ACL Aviation Consulting JV comprised of RS and H Inc. and Benchmark Management LLC. All services will be charged to and paid from account with the herein and for the purposes. All right, let's see who's going to speak to these, uh, uh, all of these. John Sheldon, the general manager of Hartsfield Jackson. That's <laughs> Sure. Uh, do you want me to take each one and pause for questions, or would you like me to go through them all? Sir? Uh, just, um, I mean, they're, they're together pretty much, so you can just talk about them in general. Uh, okay. we, we won't need to take a pause in between them. Okay. The first one is for our construction management services for $8 million, and, and that uh, uh, these individuals uh, are part of our program management and construction management team, ATL, um, and uh, they provide the inspection of the construction, the safety oversight, the, they verify the quantities that the contractors put in, they do our change order processing as we find things in the field that need to be fixed, and they manage the project schedule. Um, and they also provide uh, excellent safety oversight for us during our construction. And that uh, contract is, uh, is started in uh, March of 2017. So we're looking good for that one. The next one is the million dollars for environmental services in AECOM and we're concerned with. Uh, they provide us water quality uh, services, asbestos remediation, um, uh, groundwater and soil remediation, handling and documenting storage tanks that are underground and above ground, and stormwater pollution for rentage plan. And that's a task order for a million dollars as we do our proceed with our capital program and as we have spills and accidents on the airfield going forward. The next one is a funded task order for highlight airfield markings of five and a half million dollars. Uh, Hartsville Jackson has 1.7 million square feet of markings which are painted onto the asphalt and concrete here. Uh, that keeps us in accordance with FAA 139, which is our, our regulations on how the airport must operate and look. 
uh, and it provides standardized markings for all pilots that are operating here on the airport. And, and they do a great job for us. And uh, we receive very few, if any, comments ever about our markings because they're always in such good shape. The next one I have is for uh, BBH, Landside On-Call Electrical, which is our land side of the airport, not the airfield and the taxiways, for a million dollars. Um, and they provide us survey work of our loads, uh, electrical loads. They do electrical pair and replacement. Um, they provide our uh, installation of our underground and above ground electrical circuits and provide concrete duct banks and, and manholes that allow us to uh, manage our electrical infrastructure on the land side. The next one we have is a task order with Recundo and Creative Eye for $3 million. Those are, these, these individuals provide all of our planning here at Hartsfield Jackson uh, and they do a lot of really forward thinking things for us. Uh, they evaluate the obstacles that the airplanes may face, whether it's growing trees or buildings out in, in uh, College Park. Uh, they also provide uh, the FAA, the airport layout plan, which is our planning, major planning document. They're working on our detailed evaluation of widening Concourse D and developing our T-South uh, extension co uh, uh, concepts going forward. Uh, the next one is our funding of our task order for $13 million for four architectural firms that do design, for our design services. And they are working on, those firms are listed in the document, and they are working on our Concourse E modernization, our Concourse D widening. If you've ever been on Concourse D, you'll notice that it is very narrow. We're moving forward, hopefully, with a plan to expand the width of that to provide more spacing. We're going to, they're also working on our nine left end around taxiway, which is a loop around the end of the runway. So airplanes, when they land, can keep taxiing and go around the departure end of the runway. We have that on our north side. We're looking at doing that on our south side runway. And they're also working on the design of our new fire station 32, which previously existed over where the five gates are being built on the south, on uh, the T North concourse uh, going forward. And the next task order. Uh, we're looking to do is the $3.5 million task order for on-call uh, airside electrical um, con uh, work. And they, uh, that is going to be split between our capital and our operating. They provide our uh, FAR 139 um, airfield maintenance for electrical systems, all the lights and signs on the airport. And they do a great job for us, and they've been with us for a while. And I believe that is it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, I make a motion to approve because uh, I don't see any questions or uh, any hands raised. So I take it everybody's in line with this. So I make a motion to approve. Is there a second? Se second, Brown. All right. Let's prepare a vote. Ms. Overstreet, do you have a, uh, how do you vote? Affirmative. Thank you. Vote is closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. This item, these items are favorable. Let's go to the next item. One moment, please. Item number 18, 20-R-4307, a resolution by Transportation Committee supplementing a joint path order in an amount not to exceed $3.5 million and zero cents for use under two airside electrical on-call contractor contracts for contract numbers FC-9994A, Brooksbury, Haney & Associates, and FC-994B, MC Dean Inc. to provide on-call electrical services for the Department of Aviation on a task order basis. All services will be charged to and paid from account numbers listed herein and for other purposes. And there is an amendment to your packet to um, correct an account number in the funding stream. Okay, I'll make a motion to amend. Is there a second? Second, Brown. All right, let's uh, prepare the vote for the amendment. The vote is open. The vote is 
closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. This item has been amended. All right, Mr. Sheldon. Yes, sir. Uh, this is our airside on-call contractor, BBH and MC Dean. Um, they provide services to our airfield for our switch houses, which is where all the transformers that handle all the high voltage coming into the airport and make our lights and signs work. They work on our signs and they provide uh, maintenance and preventative maintenance to all of the 11,000, I believe, in pavement lights and uh, taxiway lights and runway lights here that we have here, excuse me, 14,000 lights that we have at Hartsfield Jackson. Um, and uh, they work mostly every night here and they do great work for us. Thank you. I'm trying to make a motion to approve as amended. Is there a second? Second, Brown. All right, let's prepare a vote. Vote is open. Mr. Westmoreland? In favor? Okay. Vote is closed. Seven days there. Eight this item is favorable as amended. Item number 19, 20-R-4308, a resolution by Transportation Committee authorizing the mayor her designee on behalf of the Department of Transportation to issue Task Order 13 with SDNC Inc. for SCA 249 annual contract for the maintenance and repair of sidewalks, curbs, driveway aprons, and associated infrastructure to add the Atlanta Department of Transportation as an additional authorized user for services in an amount not to exceed $3 million in zero cents with all contracted work to be charged to and paid from various fund department organization and account numbers listed herein and for other purposes. All right, Mr. Bowen or Ms. Alexander? This is Cosina Alexander. Okay. This is our annual, um, one of our annual sidewalk contractors who make the repairs um, that come in through 311 service request, and we're asking for approval to amend the well to add funding to the contract for FY21 in the amount of $3 million. All right. Uh, Mr. Faroki, you want to do the honor? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> I was giving you the honor to. to oh, I'm sorry. I, I was. I had to go unmute my son. Uh, yeah, motion to approve. <laughs> Ms. Overstreet, you want to second it? Second, Overstreet. All right, good deal. Let's prepare a vote. You guys are Mr. and Mrs. Sidewalk, as y'all say, so. Vote is open. <laughs> Mr. Brown, how do you vote? Affirmative. Okay. Vote is closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. This item is favorable. All right. Mr. Chair, so Ms. Pul yeah, I was going to say, Ms. Pulladini, you just mentioned that item 10 needed to be, uh, we need to go back to item 10 again. Uh, yes, there was a request from the Independent Procurement Review Office for the vote to be reconsidered. Would you like to hear from them before voting on reconsidering the vote? Yes, yes, we will. Are okay. they on the line? Uh, yes, Mr. Michael Jones should be on the line. Good morning. This is Michael Jones, the IPRO manager. <clears throat> uh, thank you for uh, hearing me, council members. Uh, the IPRO report includes a, a finding where the recommended bidder did not notarize the joint venture agreement and DOP recommended uh, submitting an ordinance to waive this requirement. But, I'm, I'm not aware that that has been done yet. So let me um, ask, um, so first, thank you for being on. Thank you for bringing this to our attention. When you say they did not notarize the joint venture agreement, are you meaning simply they did not go to a notary public and get it stamped or something, and that's what we're missing? That's correct. And, and the ordinance also, well, go ahead. Go ahead. The ordinance does call for a joint venture agreement to be notarized. Um, is there a way to, so it sounds like there's multiple ways to achieve that. One way is what you just said, which was to 
waive it in the ordinance, um, and that would require us to make an amendment to say that we waive this, uh, th that notary, notary, notary uh, situation. The second would be to, is there a way to have that, like, delay this vote? And I'll check with the, the uh, general manager, but delay this vote for two weeks, let them get a notary, and then come back? Is that possibility from your perspective, uh, I pro master? Uh, the the way I understand it is the uh, code has to be waived first, and then the uh, legislation can be, I'm, I'm assuming, voted on at that point. Yeah, I'm just trying to satisfy this uh, this uh, need for, I, I'd hate for this not to be notarized, right? So if I say, if we say yes to it, by waiving it, we don't, one, we don't want to set that as a precedent. Two, we, you know, I don't know if both parties agree without a notary. Um, so how do we move this forward? Um, or, or what if we did it with, what if we moved it forward with no recommendation? Um, and then, is, is someone from the law department on the phone? I mean, I don't want to make this a huge deal, but I do want to get something taken care of here. Um, is, is, is this is also dual referred to finance? Hi, this is uh, Attorney Tavanya Smith with the City Department of Law. How are you, uh, Council uh, Person Victor? Yes, doing well. Thank you. Can you uh, kind of opine on what's the best step forward? Well, I, I will tell you that has been an issue that we have been addressing internally, and we actually have uh, prepared uh, legislation that will be coming before uh, council uh, within the next couple of weeks regarding the removal of that notice requirement. And what has typically been done in the past is we are seeking a waiver. Um, I believe it's done in the past six, eight months. It's probably been done uh, twice. Um, it will require a waiver on this particular piece of uh, legislation regarding this contract, and there may be one more that's forthcoming. Uh, but we believe that the proposed legislation to remove that notice of part and part uh, will resolve the issue going forward. All right, you kind of got muffled at a certain point, but let me ask you, I think I understand what you said. Let me ask you a more pointed question specifically, and either one of you can chime in. And um, I see you want to speak, Mr. Westmoreland, but I think you want to say what uh, you texted me, which is to move it forward without recommendation, I mean, on, on condition that the notary gets achieved between now and September 8th. Is that doable? Um, is that something that w will allow us to not have to waive the code? I don't think you have the luxury of not waiving the code. We're going to have to waive it. So you, you have to waive that requirement, yes, sir. Not if they get it done between now and the eighth, right? Well, the document has already been signed, and so the purpose of the notary is to attest that the notary witnessed the signing of the document. So it is not something that can be done timely. Right? This is Michael Jones. If if the notary isn't isn't if the, if the joint venture is not notarized at the time, then typically that that uh, uh, should be a, a, a condition for non-response. Okay, that is no, exactly correct, and that is why in the past six to eight months we've had to come and get waivers of that requirement when, for whatever reason, the bidders were deemed to be responsive um, and that notary requirement was overlooked. Okay. All right, and so you're saying that we'll, we'll handle this situation with this one by waiving the code related to that because parties subsequently have gotten what you needed and that we're ready to move forward but then that the law department is proposing some legislation to come before council so that these situations don't occur again. Is that what you're, that's what you just said, Madam Attorney? Yes, sir. That's correct. 
Okay. Um, all right. And I, I'm thinking that this is something DOP in the future needs to be more attentive to, uh, DOP being the Department of Procurement. Um, so, all right, so this is how I will proceed. Let me just say this, and y'all tell me if this is uh, the right way to do this. So, one, we'll make a vote right now to a motion to reconsider. We'll vote to reconsider this paper. Then we will make a motion to amend this paper to um, add in uh, specific language that either one of you can give me related to uh, waiving the procurement code requiring a no notary. Um, and then we will vote on that amendment and then vote on the paper again as amended. Is that correct? Uh, Mr. Chair, this is Julia. Yeah. This legislation is a resolution, and law may want to confirm this, but I believe if, a, if the code is being waived, it has to be done by an ordinance. And this legislation is not an ordinance, it's a resolution. This is Tavania Smith, and uh, that is correct. And uh, we'll be happy to extend this is that uh, ordinance. So we can amend a resolution to make it an ordinance, or how do we? Ms. Pulandini, what steps then with that? Is that like a substitute? I'm concerned. I, I don't, I, since this has been introduced as a resolution, I don't think we can change it to be an ordinance at this point. I, I think if I'm correct, this would have to be reintroduced as an ordinance waiving the, waiving that uh, code requirement. Okay. All right. So we're just going to make a motion to reconsider and we'll just hold or file this one. And then September 8th, a new paper will be reintroduced as an ordinance. Is that correct? That's correct. You can, um, as you said, you could vote to reconsider and then vote to either file or hold and wait for the new legislation to be reintroduced as an ordinance. All right. Why don't we do a hold just because I don't know if, you know, I don't know where it's going to stand. It's easier to hold it and then we can file it after we've gotten the new one. So, um, council members, I make a motion to reconsider this item number 10, 20R4299. Is there a second? Second, second. Brown. Okay, we got a second by Mr. Brown. The vote is open. Mr. Westmoreland, how do you vote? Apologies, in favor. Okay. Vote is closed. Okay. Now, we will reconsider this paper. I will make a motion to hold. Is there a second? Second, Brown. All right, let's prepare to vote. One moment, please. The vote is open. All right, let's vote, uh, Mr. Westmoreland. And in favor. In favor, okay. Vote is closed, seven yeas, zero nays. This item will be held. All righty. So we'll see something come from the airport and the, or the DOP about this later. Are there any items held in committee? No, Mr. Chair. All right, and no walk-in legislation, right? That's correct, no walk-in. Okay, uh, are there any comments uh, by council members before we adjourn? All right, seeing none, we stand adjourned. Thank you all.